<laughs> Hello, world. Welcome back to D and D Beyond. I'm here, uh, and I, I'm, I, meaning Joe. That's my name. That's who I am. I'm the, uh, I'm the content uh, head content monk uh, here at D and D Beyond. Uh, until we find a better face to replace me with, I'm joined by uh, by a, just a just a better face, a better man, a better player, a better DM, a better brain. Jeremy Bloom, thanks for coming back, man. No problem, no problem. <laughs> uh, today we're talking about uh, Candlekeep Mysteries. Uh, maybe one last time. I don't know. Maybe not. I feel like this is a really good uh, topic to sort of go out on a bang with for our coverage of Candlekeep. Uh, you know, Candlekeep Mysteries is a collection of one shots. It's a it's an anthology series of you know seventeen adventures. Uh, they range from levels one uh, all the way up to sixteen. They're not designed to be run as a campaign, but can they? We say yes. Can they? We also say yes. So Jeremy and I are going to jump into um, uh, the lore of uh, of Candlekeep. The, the who, what, where, why, and how of Candlekeep, and more importantly uh, to us for the purposes of this stream, ideas, thought starters, little, little nuggets to put into your brain of how you can actually make Candlekeep Mysteries just one massive, really cool, fun campaign. Um, again, the book is available for, uh, for order, post-order? Is that the opposite of pre-order? It's, av yeah. it's available for post-order right now on the D&D Beyond Marketplace. So go go pick it up. Go check it out. Some really great stuff in there uh, as we've been uh, exploring over the past couple of weeks. But uh, Jeremy, let's let's jump into uh, the lore of Candlekeep. And I, I think as we do this, we'll just sort of keep, uh, you know, pausing the tour to be like, hey, what could this be and what could that be? And, you know, maybe even sort of putting this campaign together with each other on the fly, uh, an idea that I just came up with in real time live on this stream uh, that you are now uh, gonna be forced to do. Sound good? Awesome. Awesome, man. Okay, let's do this. So, you know, obviously, uh, Candlekeep Mysteries, or Candlekeep Mysteries, Candlekeep Library, uh, this amazing just fortress, this home of knowledge, uh, uh, looking over the, the Sea of Swords um, is, I mean, it's, just, it's this walking, uh, adventure starter it's full of just thousands of ancient tomes uh, and books uh, and uh, the the building itself has like a pretty solid history uh, in D&D &D. so as we sort of get into this can you sort of like walk us through Jeremy like some of the uh, the old history and places where the the setting sort of first started to show up yeah so uh, candle keep as this gigantic um kind of like the library of Alexandria in the Forgotten Realms. I think it showed up in the original gray box for the Forgotten Realms back in 19, who I want to say 1980 something, 1987. Um, I could be wrong on that, but it, it was just described as one of the largest uh, repositories of knowledge along the Sword Coast, maybe on the whole continent of Faerun itself. Um, and then it has only increased in importance uh, with every edition of D&D. It was the opening setting for Baldur's Gate, first Baldur's Gate mm -hmm. computer game in, um, I think, 98. Uh, and so a lot of uh, players know it from that. And then now with Candlekeep Mysteries, you, you have this gigantic library that it's the place to go if you need some sort of esoteric knowledge for your campaigns, or if you need to speak with an authority on matters, be it uh, matters of the other planes of existence, uh, matters of ancient matter, uh, ancient magical artifacts, all, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we saw this in Baldur's Gate, uh, Descendants of Avernus, uh, one of the um, head avowed of Candlekeep, a, a tiefling archmage. She played an important role in giving the characters a map of Avernus. And so Candlekeep is that location that you can use whenever your characters need to find out more information on the MacGuffin. Um, they can go to Candlekeep. They need to present a book or, or some kind of piece of writing that is not already available in the archives of Candlekeep. Uh, and this doesn't just have to be a fancy first edition or a fancy spell book. This can be something that has value, like an ancient journal or uh, notes from an expedition to an unknown part of the world. And so there's, there's a lot of storytelling hooks here already. What do your characters have to offer up to gain entrance into Candlekeep? What are mm -hmm. they looking for when they get in there? And for me, probably when I run uh, Candlekeep Mysteries, I'll probably end up running this for 
my girlfriend and her friend once we finish our Ghosts of Saltmarsh campaign, which is another <laughs> series of uh, <laughs> mini modules that I've managed to link together, is I'm actually probably going to make Candlekeep kind of the hub and come up with a way to have them there most of the time. Uh, we also, yeah. you know, might come up with an ongoing segment on this show called Let's Check In on Jeremy and His Girlfriend. That'd be, good. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. They're, they're currently going through Ghosts of Saltmarsh and they're nearing the end. And I managed to link all the adventures in that story together with uh, basically an overarching plot that involves a very Lovecraftian entity under the sea that is manipulating uh, Saltmarsh and all the townsfolk and is behind all the events. And so you can do similar things with this book, most definitely. Yeah. Well, you had me at a noble terror there, but uh, you know, we're sort of getting into, you know, presenting, um, this knowledge. And so I think even, you know, as we're building this campaign, right, or sort of starting to sort of set up these, these campaign ideas, I think leading into um, Candlekeep, if you are sort of continuing an ongoing campaign with established characters and stuff like that, um, I think as, as a DM, you can even personalize uh, this entrance a little bit and make things really clever. Um, you know, if you're looking ahead, knowing that at some point your players are going to end up at Candlekeep, um, does one of them have a collection of uh, of letters from a from a relative? You know, does one of them keep a journal? Does one of them keep a diary? Uh, does one of them have a funny sketchbook that's full of uh, uh, drawings of uh, of dogs, as a, a very popular uh, uh, tiefling in D and D uh, lore does? Uh, so yeah, I think there's all sorts of little tiny seeds. You know, aside from the um, you guys found this lost spell book. I mean, nothing wrong with lost spell books, but you know, if you have a bard who, um, you know, loves writing down songs and that's sort of their character's thing is, is, is building up this song book, then boom, you're, you're all of a sudden your party has a very personal connection uh, to that entry scene uh, in Candlekeep. Yeah, and the, the example I gave in the uh, Candlekeep lore article I recently wrote, which is on dndbeyond.com and you should all mm -hmm. check out. Is it's a fantastic website. Yeah, is that, hey, take inspiration from previous campaigns that you might have run at any time in the past. You know, say you're yeah. making like a fighter character and he needs entrance into Candlekeep and maybe he had a uh, an older brother or a father who happened to have undergone an expedition into the Lost Mines of Phandelver, which is the starter mm -hmm. set adventure of D&D. Um, or maybe he knew somebody that stumbled into the Shadowfell and perhaps uh, encountered Strahd. So th there's a lot of interesting nuggets of info that you can very easily pull in and it will allow you to deepen your character's backstory and perhaps your overall enjoyment of this game you've been playing multiple campaigns of over the years. Yeah. And, you know, sort of out the gate, uh, literally, well, no, at the gate, we'll say out the gate, out the gate, at the gate, uh, your, your party's going to encounter the avowed. Uh, the avowed are the religious organization uh, for, I guess, lack of a better word uh, that maintain uh, candle keep. They they worship uh, deities of knowledge, deities of art. Um, they 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 have a very strict hierarchy. Uh, the keeper of tomes is at the very top, uh, and then there's sort of like a, a, a council of uh, readers uh, underneath the keeper of tomes. Um, and the book, you know, has some really cool information um, about this group, but as they're just sort of giving you a guide to what Candlekeep could be, you know, they're fairly agnostic as far as tone. But for me, you know, reading subtext clues when I'm going through the book, I think, you know, the idea of uh, a heavily religious organization guarding this massive tome of knowledge, uh, to me, you know, sparks every weird little bit of, uh, of Da Vinci Code intrigue and subterfuge. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. Th th that I can think of, you know. Yeah, uh, you can you can put Illuminati in your D and D campaigns right here, or just you know, th there's so much lore that can be injected into these characters. Uh, the, the the book gives you. Um, kind of the, the canon individuals who are, you know, the keeper of the tombs, who, who's, mm -hmm. who, who are the head uh, avowed librarians. And there's a chart, who are the avowed um, guides that will possibly come in and take newbie adventurers to various uh, parts of the library. Um, but if you don't want to use those, you could easily homebrew your own. Um, and you Absolutely. can even come, you could even come up with, you know, really intricate uh, plot hooks that are perhaps related to, you know, some of the uh, villains in this book, you know, maybe, may, maybe yeah. some of these candle keep avowed are uh, perhaps not as um, 
concerned about the knowledge of the realms as they as they appear to be perhaps they're actually funneling books towards you know any one of the villains be it you know the order of the immortal lotus or mm -hmm. uh, or the mummy lords in these in in these adventures here so lots of cool possibilities with the avowal yeah well i i think you you bring up a great point with sort of these uh these entry level avowed npcs that might be as you're building up your massive candle keep campaign um these avowed characters who are, you know, at first look very simple, basic first level quest givers. But I think when you, once you answer the question of why, yeah, why are they so intent on getting this group into the library and steering them towards certain books mm -hmm. uh, and then tying that into the idea of, um, you know, maybe there's a civil war, you know, going yeah. on. Uh, within the avowed, you know, this 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 push pull of, uh, you know, uh, Illuminati drama. And I, I think, you know, once you you answer the question of why um, you have a lot of really fun opportunities to um, play, not only with plot, but with expectations. Uh, is the order actually evil? You know, the order of the, the White Lotus? Uh, maybe, but they also might be uh, a working towards a common purpose with this avowal that's been helping you uh you know to combat a larger evil you know at the top of uh at the top of the totem pole right no, another interesting possibility what if the player characters are avowed you know what if, what if you decide to make this into a campaign and all of your player characters are avowed and it's their job to be you know shelving these books dewey decimal system in in candle keep and, and think about they, that and then they stump, you know, some of the books in this adventure, the portals that lead to, you know, far flung places or their little intricate plot hooks. Maybe your player characters are avowed who, instead of doing their chores and duties around the library, have a hankering for adventure and then go off on these quests and still need to make it back to Candlekeep by, you know, the end of the day or, you know, the end of the week or before they're found. And suddenly you have kind of like, if you want to have that sort of, magical school or you know magical kind of member of a religious society uh feel in your D, D game that's a great way to do it and then you can really flesh out the avowed i absolutely love that that is such a good idea you know yeah. if uh and you know look if half your party is uh is is avowed and then half of your party's character backgrounds is has been trapped in a book for several hundred years you know and you you, that's such a fun way of, of putting a party together is, you know, three of them are avowed and uh, one day they find a book they weren't supposed to find and find the other, the rest of your table trapped inside. Yeah. You know? I, I'm just, I'm just thinking of the page master right, right now, which, which I remember, oh, yeah. which I remember as being a very good movie, but I'm not sure if it actually is. Cause I haven't watched it since I was like six. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. look, by, by, by our six-year-old standards, you know, um, well, look, Jeremy, what is D&D &D if not continuing if not, the, yes. the wonder of our, of our six-year-old imagination? Right? Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. Oh, I love that idea so much of the, of the player characters uh, uh, being avowed. Um, locations we've talked about in, in Candlekeep a little bit, but now we're really trying to tie them into, you know, the idea of how do we thread you know, these, uh, these campaigns together. Um, obviously there's the, the catacombs, mm -hmm. uh, beneath candle keep, uh, which, which include, uh, Alondra the Seer's, uh, predictions, this, this, uh, this infamous prophet, uh, who, you know, could allegedly see into the future and kind of see, you know, what's to come. Yeah. Uh, are your characters, you know, uh, within this organization, uh, slowly trying to gather tools and skill sets through these adventures to eventually um, break in to uh, uh, to these catacombs, or yeah. um, you know, or to steal a page from Harry Potter, uh, break into a place they're not supposed to break into, uh, so that they can beat someone from breaking into it first, you know? Yeah, and and um, Aluando the Sage is he's an interesting guy because this is a the, kind of the Nostradamus of Faerun who predicted yeah. all the events in the Baldur's Gate games. He he predicted, according to the lore, potentially the end of the world, um, and all of his. He only lived in, according to the lore, he only lived in Candlekeep for about a year before he, I think he died of the plague. And he wrote down various uh, scriptures and prophecies while he was there. And so all of his stuff is scattered around in the library at various points. And some of it is off access, um, only accessible by the keeper of the tomb. So there's a lot of potentially, you know, imagine the, um, 
you know, the, the final scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where, where the government has access to all of these crazy things like the Ark of the Covenant, you know, aliens, yeah. and they all stick it in this big warehouse. Candlekeep has sections that are like that warehouse. And just imagine that instead of a big warehouse full of boxes, you've got scrolls or ancient books or prophecies written by this, this sagely figure um, that could you know, foretell anything. And maybe the monks of Candlekeep are aware of these prophecies. Maybe they aren't. Maybe, you know, the keeper of the tombs is uh, secretly in line with uh, one of the villains of your campaign and is trying to keep, you know, these prophecies under wraps. And so your characters could get in there, steal things. There's, there's a whole a spectral dragon guarding uh, yes, the underground yeah. catacombs of uh, Candlekeep. That's a great character, uh, Miram, the spectral worm. And uh, the idea I put forth in my article was basically the idea of a suicide squad type evil campaign, because we don't see a lot of those where your characters are rogues and, you know, or maybe they could be avowed with a with a penchant for 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 stealing or for mischief. And they're trying to go down in the catacombs and steal stuff or desecrate ancient tombs. And they actually have to come into contact with this spectral ghostly dragon. And boom, that's that's an instant campaign. That's idea so right fun there. And if we're doing that, then dibs on Slipknot, the uh, the man who dibs on cast... Slipknot, yes, the best <laughs> the best man... character in Suicide Squad, the man who can cast Spider Climb on himself. Yes, <laughs> and that's the only thing that he can do. Um, so yeah, I think um, uh, Alondro, uh, you know, with this uh, with this campaign idea that we're sort of like building in real time, I, I you know, th- nothing really beats that MacGuffin, right? You know, the, these prophecies and these catacombs. Uh, we have these player characters as avowed, um, uh, possibly being manipulated by forces uh, within the library. Um, of course, it's a fun way as a DM to, um, and you know, make sure you're you're watching yourself and not making sure you're not completely taking the agency of your players away or taking the um, value of their deci- decisions. And uh, sorry, I got a little connery there for a second. <laughs> uh, decisions and uh, you know choices away, but. Uh, what is a what is a uh, you know an an intrigue driven campaign without that moment that they realize that they've been uh, you know pulled along on a string you know this entire time, um, so yeah you know we have a, a, a Alondro as as this uh, as this big bad you or well, sorry Alondro as um, you know this end game you have Miram as this as this possible uh, big bad in within candle keep which is or, which or is an ally so you know or an ally if you're yeah if you're no absolutely managed, or if your characters manage to play their cards right yeah absolutely absolutely uh and so yeah ultimately i think um you know there's so many little details that i you know you could consider throw away you know in the book you know the the drunk ogre trying desperately to learn uh you know and read and, and better himself um, and then all He's of great. these, I love him. yeah, so, so fun. And, you know, that's the kind of character, um, as my player characters, as, as the avowed, that's the, the, uh, I'm going to step on your hearts character for me. You know, that's the kind of guy that I own in on. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to make them love him. I'm going to make them love him. And then he's going to hold the door so hard. <laughs> <laughs> like that guy's got a hold door for my players so hard and they're gonna hate me um yeah that's that's just the kind of stuff i absolutely love and also i i'm so sorry we jumped right into this but uh as we continue uh chat thank you guys so much for being here uh if you got questions toss them in there uh we'd love to chat about them and then you know if you're watching the future on youtube also hello thank you so much for being here uh if you're just joining us candle keep mysteries on sale now at the dnd beyond marketplace we're talking about how to turn uh, the series of one-shot adventures into just like one massive intrigue-driven uh, campaign. And Jeremy, you know, if you'll indulge me, I think we're doing like a pretty good job. Yeah, no, I think I think so. Yeah, yeah, like like a pretty solid job, man. So we have, uh, you know, we sort of have uh, Miram as this uh, uh, like third act, either. Uh, enemy obstacle or unlikely ally because I think depending on how you there's look I never thought I'd say this sentence but there's a lot of ways that you can play a, a ghost dragon that guards a you know a horde of knowledge in a basement um, 
maybe Ima- there. I- imagine, like I'm imagining just characters snooping around in the basement and trying to find, you know, illicit books or trying to learn more about the prophecies of Aluindo. Or I'm imagining that scene in, you know, the fir- early Harry Potter books where, uh, you know, the kids are wandering around in the hallways that are closed off to students. And, and now just think of this spectral dragon head appearing through um, a hole bookshelf and gazing down at the players and what a moment right there so fun yeah that reveal is so so good um uh because old libraries are creepy to begin with and to realize the thing that you're pretty sure is following you is a giant spectral worm um that's a fun moment that's real good uh jeremy what are as we sort of and we'll we might get into spoiler territory a little bit here with um with, with diving into some of the other adventures, but I'd love to talk about sort of now that we have the skeleton of a campaign uh, built out, how some of these other adventures, how some of our favorite ones can sort of build into this. Um, the, the one that jumped out to me most was, um, you know, with this idea of warring factions within the avowed, uh, you of course have Candlekeep Deconstruction, mm-hmm. um, where suddenly you realize that there is a third faction uh, in this war <laughs> in the avowed, and uh, this faction is uh, is led by a crazy group that wants to launch a tower into space. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, what are what do you think are some other really good, um, you know, key characters uh, along the way in Candlekeep that can really start to fill the sucker out? So probably what I would do is I would look at all of the villains in. Uh, in the adventures and the nice thing about a book like this is that it, it is it is modular because the, you know mm-hmm. you have adventures like launching one of candlekeep spires into space to you know going to the shadow fell there's a lot of variants here and there's there's a greater selection of potential big bad villains than, than you normally have in, mm-hmm. in your standard dnd book you have uh xanthoria this creepy druid turned lichen lich who i just love as a villain um you have uh bach may the head of this the the immortal lotus sect you have a, a mummy lord whose name i'm forgetting right now you have an exiled fey um and so uh, this was an idea i put in my article what i what i'll probably do is i'm probably going to say that at some point you know maybe these villains were kind of like their own like legion of doom like injustice league kind of collective of bad guys um, at some point in the past, and maybe they were defeated. Maybe they were defeated by um, monks fr- from the avowed or adventurers working with these monks. But perhaps they're rising again in various parts of the world. Um, mm-hmm. And the only hint to their whereabouts exists in these books that are in Candlekeep. So these, th- this could be um, a plot thread that the players discover as they're exploring the library. This could be information that they hear from Miriam if they manage to befriend Miriam or talk to them. This could be stuff that's slowly unveiled throughout the adventure. If you keep these villains in mind and find ways to sprinkle little breadcrumbs into every adventure, then you can create an overarching narrative that sits atop all of the 17 modules. For example, um, the Book of Cylinders, which talks about um, this conflict between the Gripply, the frog folk from, uh, I think, 3.5 D&D, and the UNT. Uh, maybe the UNT, instead of just being, you know, kind of evil snake people, maybe they're being manipulated by one of these, um, you know, Legion of Doom villains. Yeah. And then you, you've, ins- you've succeeded in making not only the villains of this particular uh, adventure a little bit deeper, but you've, you've, you've seeded your players' minds with thoughts of the overarching narrative. And, and that's what I'm probably going to do when I actually run this. Yeah, which sounds so fun. And, you know, just I, I keep going back to the question of why. And I, I think why is uh, as you're building your stories and building out your campaigns uh, and even building a character, I think why is the most important question you can ask yourself, uh, whether it's... Um, you know what? I think my character has a sword. Why? Uh, well, because uh, 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 their dad uh, trained them to use a sword. Well, why? And they're like, well, because hmm, their dad was a was a famous sword master, and uh, they really wanted their their uh, their daughter to to uh, to continue the legacy. But then maybe she didn't want it anyway. So why? Point being, why? Great question to ask. And so when I ask why with our Legion of Doom. Uh, why are they rising again? Why are they reuniting? Why are they suddenly uh, becoming this problem again? Uh, you know, what's going to be the polar opposite of this Legion of Doom? 
Uh, and that leads me to sort of the, um, I, I swear I have a point, Jeremy. I'm getting there. Um, Maybe there's a prophecy yeah. by Aluendo, uh, by, by this ancient sage mm -hmm. that says that at some point, you know, maybe this year in your game world, that a group of avowed or a group of um, adventurers are going to come together from, from different paths and unite against this, this old threat that was previously thought eliminated. And you have, you have uh, villains in here from like the Feywild. You have villains in here from other parts yeah. of the realms. Like this is, th there's potential to have like a very world spanning um, threat or some world spanning event going on here that, that perhaps is hinted about in the prophecies. It's just nobody knows who will actually enact this prophecy. Yeah. And then I, you take your players through the whole thing and they realize they are the prophecy. Yeah, uh, which, is, which is super, super fun. And, you know, to sort of uh, give a, a separate poll to sort of this, uh, this Legion of Doom, uh, right. And I apologize in my head. I keep going to the WWF uh, tag team from the eighties and, and uh, seeing, the, seeing Hawk and animal and candle keeps very funny to me. Um, but, uh, you know, I always think, you know, when I picture uh, an elderly avowed, you know, the archetype I always go back to is a, is a Gandalf or a Dumbledore, you know, these, um, uh, these old sort of seemingly pure, seemingly, you know, pinnacles of good, that would stand for the opposite of everything that this Legion of Doom type group uh, would stand for. Um, but, you know, even twisting that concept on its head, you know, going back to our warring factions, our Illuminati, um, is this person ultimately good? You know, uh, it to might me, not be, the, yeah. yeah, to me, the idea even of Candlekeep, if you really just want to like push it far, even, the idea of Candlekeep Library might not be good. Talk about uh, a candle keep deconstruction right there. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, it's, it's stasis, right? And yeah. um, it, it, it's, it's dust uh, collecting on these things that could change the world. And, uh, you know, uh, and you have, uh, you have the, uh, the avowed, you know, hoarding that, that knowledge. Uh, you know, the, the keeper of tomes yeah. hoarding that knowledge. And so maybe this Legion of Doom rising up, uh, you know, they always seem, you know, Bakme seems very much, you know, he wants these particular scrolls. So many of these so often are um, people who are in search of a power that is within uh, Candlekeep. You know, the scrolls, and look, I'm, I'm bending... I'm bending the intent of the of uh, the author a little bit. I'll tweet him later and see if it's okay. But you know what? Ultimately, is what Bakme's after bad? I don't know. Well, that, that, know? That, that, that's the thing, though. You know, the, in that particular adventure, there is a sentence that says, you know, Bakme, he was once an honorable warrior. Perhaps he's he should be deeper than your standard, you know, villainous mastermind. That there's more behind mm -hmm. the scenes here. So, I, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. You, you could definitely. You know, you could definitely play around with the idea that knowledge should be for everyone um, and it should not be sequestered away in these forgotten tombs and, and it should not be kind of uh, only the property of a select mm -hmm. few. You know, if, if these prophecies within Candlekeep actually foretell the end of the world, then why is it that only a few monks have access to them? Yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, uh, again, why? If you're going to... If, if you're going to Dan Brown up Candlekeep Mysteries into one massive sprawling series uh, uh, of stories that, you know, are just this giant campaign uh, of intrigue and, and mystery, the more shades of gray, I think you can add to that. And the more you can play on ideas of, of you know, like, man, you know, this person was once honorable. Mm -hmm. um, why are they doing what they're doing? What's twisted them to get there? I think the more you... Uh, you take that same template, that same question, apply it to every NPC, every quest giver, every, you know, every bad guy, every good guy, um, you know, every undead worm guarding a basement um, in your campaign. I think the the more fun your players are going to have sort of exploring this or they might just, you know, pull their hair out in frustration because there's so many, you know, choices. But that's up to you as, as a DM to be a good shepherd. Totally. Um, uh, Jeremy Source asks uh, in chat, uh, as Candlekeep is so steeped in Forgotten Realms lore, uh, how do you create a version of a campaign for other worlds or your homebrew world uh, that doesn't look like it's a ripoff? 
I mean, I, you know, look, you 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 name checked it a little bit at the beginning of the of the video, Jeremy. But you know, Candle Keep itself is sort of a a, a take yeah. and an homage, if you will, to uh, to Alexandria. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah, I mean, being the, an the, amalgamation. Yeah, the um the actual book gives you some suggestions. They talk about you know, uh, for example, if you're doing if you're we're still running a Greyhawk campaign, the Great Library and the Free City of Greyhawk, like there, there, and there's examples for mm-hmm. Exandria and other places as well. I would not worry too much about um, creating something in, in particularly in a homebrew campaign that seems a little bit too much like Candlekeep because all Candlekeep really is is this idea of this massive collection of knowledge and if you're playing in this this kind of quasi medieval fantasy setting or even in, in a world like Eberron that is more steampunk th- th- there are just just look at li- gigantic libraries that exist in the real world just imagine a world that you know doesn't mm-hmm. really have the internet and all the knowledge is still sequestered in these 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 old buildings and and think about the secrets and think about the um the all the books that that align the shelves that are filled with the history of not just your world but but the very planes of existence and take that idea and run with it um Mm -hmm. imagine that you know just this is where the movers and shakers of my world come because Candlekeep is a place visited by Elminster by Morden Kane and you know people across the plains they don't have to be native to the Forgotten Realms what location in your homebrew world um could mimic that kind of feel you know, just make sure, and, 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 you know, if you're playing in a fantasy setting, it's probably going to have books. If you're, if you're playing D&D in like a sci-fi setting, maybe it's like, maybe, you're, maybe Candlekeep is a gigantic server, you know, floating out in space or something like that. And, you know, it's got holographic images of all the history that has occurred in the known universe. Yeah, which I, I love. Yeah, just full, go full Jedi Temple. Uh, I'm yeah, into it. Jedi um, Temple there, you know, don't kill the yeah. younglings, but yeah, they, yeah, 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 please, please. Oh God. Um, uh, those poor younglings, they just did, they didn't know what was coming. Um, in, uh, in my homebrew, in my home game, uh, homebrew that I was running for quite a while, it was sort of a, sort of a, and I know it's not the most original thing in the world, but I, I liked it. I was happy with it. It was sort of a, um, a forgotten realms, um, uh, old West, uh, kind of flavor. The idea of, uh, we have a continent, um, settlers have come in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just sort of really, and look, I don't know how successful I was in doing it. Uh, uh, it a lot of it was probably very shallow. And then a lot of it was probably, uh, you know, doing my old college try, but sort of trying to play with the idea of um, uh, colonialism and sort of pilgrims and stuff coming into a new continent and laying claim. The, the, the premise was uh, various elves from various failed elven states uh, have decided to band together and show up on this like unpopulated continent and lay claim. Uh, and one of the things that was slowly leading to was uh, my amalgamation of Candlekeep, which was, um, you know, even before the the current natives, there was a civilization that was there before. And Candlekeep, my Candlekeep was a part of that. So it's just this buried, forgotten uh, house of house of you know lore and knowledge that uh, becomes a huge flashpoint between all of these factions that have like laid claim uh, on this land yeah. Uh, so yeah your candle keep doesn't even necessarily have to be you know a, a currently like well-run fortress it can be lost it can be uh, it can be yeah. in absolute ruins it could be you know you could play with the idea of how in fantasy settings you often see hints of old civilizations with um uh, with, with better technology than, than what currently exists. And you could have Candlekeep mm-hmm. being built on the ruins of that. You could have old uh, old grimoires in Candlekeep hinting at, you know, ancient technology that once existed. Uh, Rime of the Frost Maiden has the ancient kingdom of Netheril as a massive plot point and, and how yeah. that, that whole kingdom was, was advanced in many ways and, you know, floated in the sky. So you could totally play with something like that in a homebrew world. Yeah, my uh, my advanced kingdom in, in my homebrew was basically just an excuse to bring my favorite elements from different Western movies together so that yeah. we could have Tremors, Worms and the giant spider machine from Wild Wild West Excellent. all in, the, oh. you know, in, in one glorious place. You had to uh, bring out Wild Wild West. <laughs> <laughs> I have to at least once a week. Uh, uh, Reikio 407, here's my favorite thing about uh, the D&D Beyond community is oftentimes when I ask for questions, Jeremy, they'll just say a very good idea and then put a question mark at the end of it. Uh, so Reikio 407 has this very good idea that poses a question, Candlekeep as a silver dragon horde? 
to which I say yes. Yeah, that's so. So the interesting thing is that I'm checking the book right now, and Miriam is listed as a silver dragon. So um, there we go. So boom, yeah. Maybe Candlekeep is a silver dragon horde. Maybe Miriam tried to make this horde her own. Maybe there was mm-hmm. another dragon that owned it at one point. And then you've uh, th- there's there's some layers there that you can play with. I think. Yeah. yeah Cam- if you want to, Candlekeep do, is that silver dragon's horde. Yeah. If you want to do an alt history, uh, Miriam succeeded. Uh, Miriam showed up because you know uh, they wanted they wanted this uh, this 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 uh, all of this knowledge as their as their horde to sit on and mm-hmm. defend and you know do dragony things with it so you know what if miram succeeded and drove out the avowed uh what if your player characters are the next generation of avowed who have been tasked to reclaim uh candle keep to sneak in to s- snag these books um yeah you know if we're playing with that idea and we're, we're we are once again deconstructing candle keep and making it a little bit different <laughs> and making it like this ancient ruin of a library that that was once miram's horde you know the books have managed to have been preserved because let's say you know a dragon really cares about his horde maybe miram cared about knowledge and she took great pains to make sure the books have existed for many years but she herself has decayed and is now merely a ghost mm. so there you go candle keep is the dungeon and as your players explore it, they, you know, instead of opening chests and finding treasure, they unlock rooms featuring old bookshelves and find these, these, yeah. these old um, stories that, you know, still have relevance in the presence and then ultimately come, come up with perhaps rival adventurers or, or other avowed who are trying to loot these yeah. rooms. And then you have, like, you have a, a, a cult. tomb raiding campaign, a cult, yeah. Yeah, a cult of Miram that, uh, that believes that uh, all of this knowledge is the rightful property uh, of this dragon that they worship as a god. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that was a very good uh, idea that you posed as a question, Reiki 407, and we super appreciate you doing it because uh, that is super, super fun. Uh, Jeremy, and uh, last call for questions to you, Chad. I again, appreciate you guys watching very much. Um, are, are there any other um, you know, plot hooks, elements, uh, from Candlekeep Mysteries that you're just like, man, this is this is ripe to just start really building around, or this is like a perfect piece of connective tissue, for, you know, for that that second act reveal uh, for your players. Uh, this is a character I can't wait for them to meet. You know, this is a character that's going to come back in the third act and surprise everybody. Uh, mainly, I just like sitting around and shooting the shit with you about Candlekeep Mysteries. Yeah. Um- uh, one one thing that I did find when doing some research into the library is that um, the the skull of Aluando the Sage is uh, supposedly you know from his actual body, um, and uh, if you cast a Speak with Dead spell, it'll still you'll still be able to talk with him, and he can tell you all about these old prophecies, um, which are only hinted about in the modern version of Candlekeep. They have a reciter who goes around singing the prophecies uh, of old, and they have you know these these old gemstones which rec- which contain actual recordings of this prophet's words. Now, th- this 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 skull that was stolen and sold on the black market apparently according to uh drist twerden's guide to the underdark from 1990 um mind flares <laughs> mind flares are after it mind flares from essentially the underdark version of candle keep this big mind flayer city where they have their own library except it's like brains just brains in 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 brine um they're trying to find this ancient skull of this nostradamus type prophet because they want to find all the knowledge and 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 so what i think i might do is when i run these adventures just include just stick in um a traveling group of mind flayer rivals to torment the players at every passing opportunity so fun and and you know maybe in the beginning adventures the players are really going to be frightened of these these squid like creatures that show up and maybe steal certain items from them or maybe interrogate them or whatnot but then yeah. as they advance in power because this book goes up to level uh, i think it's 16 16 or 17 16 uh, they'll be able to take on mind flares and so you you have this interesting kind of like rival situation i'm thinking like gary oak except he's a mind flare except for saying like smell you later he you know you know he his tentacles reach out and try to suck your brains out Yes, which I'm very into. And look, I, I know the question uh, or the answer to this question is probably no. But what if it was yes? Uh, what if uh, one of them mind flayers got one of their uh, little worms in the mirror? And uh, uh, what, what, what could a mind flayer uh, create out of, um, out of a spectral ghost worm? Yeah, uh, I, I'm into it. A spectral ghost uh, mind flayer abomination. I'm sort of mm-hmm. into it. Uh, we have one last question, Jeremy, and then I will, uh, I will stop forcing you to be my friend. Uh, 
uh, and I will let you uh, move on with your life. Um, with my life. <laughs> with your life. Uh, oh, we have two questions. Hi, you got to be my friend a little while longer. Oh, uh, darn it. Uh, Kelbar05 asks, talking about wizards, how would you bring in red wizards uh, into uh, Candle Keep? So the, the red, yeah. wiz red wizards of uh, Thay. Red wizards of Thay, the Zentarum, all fairly um, easy forces to bring into Candlekeep because mm -hmm. they're into collecting knowledge. Even if you're playing with, I think, the modern version of the Zentarum, which is it, it was much less of a force than they were in older editions of D&D, &D, they're still really interested in getting all the knowledge. You know, they're still led by Manshoon. Um, you could easily have Red Wizards and Zentarum agents infiltrate Candlekeep, um, uh, you know, kind of ghost the players as they investigate these, uh, the, these books, as they go on their adventures, as they possibly take down villains and then the Zentarm could or the Red Wizards could jump in steal the book for themselves. Perhaps the Red Wizards are allied with some of the villains in this book. Uh, there's mm -hmm. great potential there. And, you know, we, we talked earlier about a villain collective, a Legion of Doom. Um, you could easily make all the villains in this book, you know, if you're playing around Forgotten Realms lore, maybe they were all members of the Zentarum inner circle at some point. Or maybe yeah. they maybe they were. Some of them were Red Wizards of Thay. Um, yeah. And there you go. Yeah, I think, um, you know, and again, you know, sort of adding to uh, to that intrigue and double crossing and, and searching for knowledge there again, they're, they're also such an easy organization to, to insert into this. And uh, again, you know, another one of our DDB community community members uh, posing a wonderful idea as a question uh, because their organization itself was so competitive and everyone was trying to one up each other mm -hmm. uh, with knowledge. And there's so many uh, rivalries that, you know, ultimately crippled uh the group and that's that's such a fun concept to play into this you know um uh what if a, one of our avowed or you know what if one of our legion of doom members is um sort of using uh red wizards you know as as their puppets you know i'm promising yeah. you power if you help me um, you know, get at the uh, the prophecies or something like that. One yeah. uh, one one danger I fall into is making my campaigns way too big right away. Uh, so eventually, this might need some editing down. This sprawling epic but, retelling. But this th th this is why I do like um, adventure anthologies because they provide you with mm -hmm. small fragments that will inevitably grow huge as you come up with an overarching plot for them, but are ultimately still small fragments. So you can come up with this grand campaign idea that we've been uh, brainstorming back and forth, or you can just run, you know, the uh, you know five page adventure as it is in the book. Or if you're like me and you DM every other Wednesday for a group of dudes that sometimes forget their abilities or not sometimes all the time forget their abilities this is a great <laughs> kind of dragon like drag and drop kind of campaign where there's an overarching mm -hmm. thing to pay attention to but if a player mm -hmm. misses a couple sessions and misses one adventure they they don't need to be filled in uh, uh, with all the details as long as they remember the overarching plot on top of everything yeah and look you know he, honestly uh you can do what we're doing right now and have a, a crazy conspiracy theory level board of just interconnected factions and plot threads and stuff like that because that's what i really love to do mm -hmm. but honestly look uh if you're dming and you're just and you're running your players through candle keep the moment you make a small connection a simple one an easy one i promise you your players are gonna crap their little candle keep knowledge seeking mystery pants uh, uh, you're, you're, you're going to leave that session a conquering hero. So this doesn't have to get super convoluted uh, and complicated. Uh, it's fun to make it that convoluted, but you can, it's just sometimes it's as simple as, wait, that bad guy showed up again here. Uh, and that's super, super rewarding, especially if, you know, uh, if you're sometimes dealing with a, a table uh, like Jeremy's dealing with, yeah. or sometimes people I, I, I love my table, but it's very, it's very beer and pretzels D and D. I have my girlfriend's game, which is like they take notes. Like my girlfriend, her friend, they've got a notebook. They write down everything. You know, they always try to talk with the enemy before engaging in combat. And then I have the group of six dudes on alternating Wednesdays. Wednesdays, we're like, let's go, and they let's just run. let's go. <laughs> they might just go in and just start pushing over bookshelves uh, yeah. and then uh, get all the books. <laughs> their big enemy of their candle keep campaign is just the very frustrated librarians that very much want them to leave. Yeah. Um, uh, one last question. Uh, Title asks uh, possible candle keep uh, Twitch stream question mark. 
I don't hate that idea uh, at all. And um, uh, I will uh, I will end this stream with a uh, with an apology and a tease. Um, I know that uh, uh, you guys have been very very patient as you as you wait for uh, for more new uh, D and D Beyond content to start ramping up and, and getting started. Uh, it is on the way. We're gonna do some stuff that uh, I mean I'm pretty excited about. I can't promise everyone's gonna love it. But I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, so I appreciate everybody's patience uh, as we're sort of starting to to ramp things up and and you know grow this team and and grow D and D beyond. Um, that said, uh, uh, there might be some things if that's the kind of stuff that you're uh, you're into. There might be some things coming up that you dig. Well, that's a that's a decent tease, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, dude, uh, thank you as always so much for, uh, for coming and hanging out with me. Uh, and thank you guys so much uh, for watching. Uh, again, Candlekeep Mysteries on sale at the D&D Beyond Marketplace. If you're watching on YouTube in the future, there is a link in the description below. Uh, there is also a link in the description below to Jasper's Game Week. Uh, that is coming up. Uh, if, uh, if you're watching D&D Beyond content in chronological order this week on the dev update, we will be talking uh, with Fenway, uh, the amazing founder of that organization, about all the cool ways that uh, you can get involved and help support that really, really wonderful charity. So please tune into that. Uh, Jeremy, where can people find you on the internet? You guys can find me on Twitter at Pixel Grotto. You can also find me on the D&D Beyond website where I've been putting out articles and you should read every single one of them. You absolutely should. Uh, an amazing talent. And uh, I just, I appreciate you uh, so much uh, being a part of this, man. I really, really do. Uh, you guys can catch me right here on D&D Beyond as the Los Angeles sun slowly continues to creep in, overtaking the room that I stream from until I am just a white, just, just a pure white uh, being of light. Uh, uh, talking about elves and clerics with you guys right here on D&D Beyond. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Be safe. Ha, 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 ha.